just a little bit about Mercy House, just okay. a couple other things okay. Terry and I were talking about. Sunday night, we're veering from, we've just finished 2 Kings, we're going to be going into First and Second Chronicles, but we're taking a little bit of a detour into Psalm 119. We've had about three or four studies in Psalm 119, and so we're going to pick it up again tonight, Psalm 119, verse 65, and we'll be looking at three of the stanzas tonight. So turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119, verse 65. We don't know who the author of Psalm 119 is. Most scholars believe it's King David, but all in all, it rests with the Holy Spirit. Why don't you go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. I'm just going to read the first stanza, and we'll get into our study. Verse 65, Psalm 119, You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Once again, Father, I just pray that we would see how dear the psalmist holds your word, Lord, because it's that which meets him in the midst of situations and circumstances of life. Father, we're on the cusp of a new week, and so, Lord, I pray that you would prepare us even right now for all that you would have for us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. It was a couple of weeks ago, it was... Um, my grandson Henry's birthday, and he likes to go to Chick-fil-A. He likes the playground there. So we all met there, and then we were on our way back to his house to have cup birthday cupcakes. My wife and I and my mother-in-law, we came down the freeway, got off on Euclid, and we were headed south on Euclid, and we turned left on, I believe it was 5th Street, and there's the light there, and we're waiting in the center divider for the light to change. Finally, it changes. It changes to green, and it is my habit. I always look both ways, and I look to the left, which was unnecessary, because if you're familiar with Euclid, the center divider's there, and you're just dealing with the traffic going from left to right, heading north. And so I look the other way, and lo and behold, here comes a car. And just the light has now been green for about five seconds or so. And the car just goes sailing right on through. The guy's looking at this. He had a light kind of flashed in his eyes, so I imagine he was reading his, his cell phone. And it was a pretty big SUV. So I can imagine if we pulled out in front of him, the damage that would have been caused. My wife and my mother-in-law were both sitting on that side of the car, and I don't like my chances in that situation either. This is an event that causes you to stop and to consider. Consider? We could have been killed. But really, it causes you to consider just the bereavity of life and how fragile life is. But the bigger part of the conclusion that I came to is, first of all, things like this happen and are always going to happen in this world because we live in a lost world. So many times we can wonder what's going on, or why did that happen, or how come the Lord allowed that, but we live in a lost world. People get sick, accidents do happen, and life is anything but fair. Secondly, come to a conclusion when you have a close call, bottom line is God's in control. Job, in, in chapter 1, verses 21 through 22, he said, And naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not charge God with sin or charge God with wrong. And so there's always that realization that God controls all the events. All of these things are working together for the good. And so I have to be of the mindset that our God, our God truly is in the details of our lives. And then thirdly, get over it and move on. Seriously, God has our lives in his hands. The day of my birth... Well, that was orchestrated by the Lord. I'm very confident the day of my death, God's got that encompassed as well, and there's nothing I can do about it. 
I just need to enjoy God, to be obedient to His call, and to fulfill all His desires through my ministry and through my efforts. It's what we all need to do. The psalmist in Psalm 39, verse 4 said, Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. He's wanting God to give him the realization that, well, as long as I got today, this day, Lord, use me and, 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 and cause me to value it. Because tomorrow, tomorrow is not promised to anyone. I can't tell you how many times somebody was with us one moment and gone the next. And so we need to value one another. We need to value the day that God has given us. And we need to understand that as God is in control, He's working all things out according to His plan. And so as I enter into that, there is going to be times, though, that afflictions enter in. So what is God's purpose in human suffering? Or again, the term the psalmist used here is affliction. When he says affliction, the idea is is to be bent over by a heavy weight. So have a heavy weight upon you. And we've all understand what that means as we've dealt with situations at work and family, wherever it might be, these things that can seem so overwhelming and just seems like this heavy weight has been placed upon us. So why does God allow affliction in the human life? Well, first, God allows affliction so that we would have a constant reminder, this isn't heaven. This isn't heaven. Matter of fact, For the born-again believer, it's far from it. God does not want you to be attached to earth. He wants you to be attached to him and eternity with him. An interesting contrast in how God has created us. He's given us an intense desire for life. Man, man is eternal, but our time on earth will determine our eternal address. The decisions we make, especially concerning Christ. And so man has been given this intense desire for life, but also understanding that when we are absent from the body, we'll be present with the Lord. Man's not to hold on to this life with a clenched fist. Our time here on earth, it's a journey. But heaven, heaven's our destination. And as born-again believers, we need to understand that. Because as we see the things that are going on across this nation and on the other side of the world, sometimes those things can get the best of us. Because we don't like to see the wars that go on. We don't like to see the poverty that is out there. And again, we need to be in the midst of that, ministering the gospel, but also understanding that this is a journey. My destination, my destination, well, Jesus said, behold, I go and prepare a place for you. Secondly, God allows affliction for corrective purposes. Matter of fact, the psalmist, I just read it, he points it out in verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. And what that tells me is what I've seen in my life and in the lives of others. Before we're afflicted, sometimes we can fall into routine so easily. We can ignore the the desires that God has for us and even obedience to his word and even we can head off into the direction of sin. But God allows burdens to enter into our lives so that we would come back to him. And how do we come back to him? We enter in through his word. I mean, there's mornings when I wake up and I do my devotions, my daily reading, and I finish, as I pointed out before, can't really remember what I just read have to go back and revisit it once again because, well, sometimes you just your mind wanders and you're thinking about what you're going to be doing and where you're going to be going. But I guarantee you when hardship comes upon you, you're valuing every single word. You're begging the Lord to speak to me and to guide me in this situation because I realize my frailty in it. And that's the idea behind what the psalmist is saying. God's correcting him, and God does correction for the purpose of restoration. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. So the idea here is now that I am afflicted, I now keep his word. It's brought me back to where I need to be. Thirdly, God allows affliction for the purpose of quickening, sharpening, and developing our character. It's been said, if you take care of your integrity, then God will guard over your character. Your character is how other people perceive perceive you. You know people of immoral character, people who can be repulsive because of the things that they say, the things that they do. I am to have the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And it's as I display that character that I am reflecting the Lord to this world. And so God allows affliction so that I would quicken it, sharpen it, and develop it, that I would understand the necessity for it. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations or afflictions, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. Fourthly, God allows affliction for the purpose of glorifying himself, that we would seek him during those difficult days, that we would understand that he's our peace, he's our comforter, and he's our deliverer. In John chapter 11, verse 4, this is when the Lord heard of Lazarus' death. It says, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Well, this was a sickness that Lazarus had. He would eventually die, but the Lord knew that he was going to bring him back to life. Why? So that we would see that Jesus is not only Lord of our lives, but more importantly, just as importantly, he's also the Lord of the day of our deaths. And then in John chapter 9, verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither this man or his parents sin, speaking of the blind man, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So the afflictions that we, we endure or for the purpose of God being glorified, that others would see us looking to him. What is it about Bob, that, that Christian guy that lives down the street? He, he's got these hard things that have, have all of a sudden come upon him, but still he worships his God. He still looks to him for his answers. And what you're seeing is his faith that this man has weren't during this time of testing. Because it's easy to praise God when things are going well. How do you do when things aren't going so well or according to how you think they should go? And then fifthly, there are cosmic purposes for God allowing affliction. James Montgomery Boyce said, Cosmic suffering demonstrates before Satan and the angels that a person can love and trust God for who he is in himself and not merely for what a person can get from him. And so this is a cosmic witness, if you will. And it just validates God, who God is, and God's relationship with mankind. The purpose of afflictions is what is examined in these three stanzas that we'll be looking at tonight. If you recall, a couple of weeks ago, we took last Sunday night off because of Father's Day, but the psalmist had become a learner of the word. He learned God's ways through learning God's word. And and then we also saw how he became a doer of the word. And we saw that progression this morning as we looked at James, that if you truly have faith, it will be expressed through your actions. But we also see that as you express your faith, as you have faith that works, there's also going to be opposition to that faith. All who desire to live godly will suffer opposition. And so we see where he has wandered off the way now and God has allowed affliction to enter enter in in order to bring him back on track. Before I became pastor here 25 years ago or whenever it's been, when I first came into ministry, I was a children's minister. And... We had a kids camp and we wanted, the kids wanted to hike to a lake that was about three or four miles away. And so I'm the leader, I'll lead you to the lake. And so we went off on a trail and couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. And probably a little bit and kids started complaining because it was so far. All right, let's turn around and go back. So we turned around and went back and we couldn't find the camp. We couldn't find the camp. And I realized we're lost. I've led them astray. Not a good thing when people entrust you with the lives of your children. How did I find the way? I found the proper path, and we followed that path. How did I know the proper path? Because it was a path that was well-traveled. The, 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 the path was cut very clearly in the way that we should go. See, my problem was I made a mistake. The path kind of forked off, and I took the easy way. I took kind of the downhill way where the uphill way was the way that was necessary. And sometimes the way, the way that we need to take is the difficult way, but it's the right way. It's the way that God ordains, and it's the way that God blesses. What is the exact desired result of God's sent affliction for correction? How do we get back on track? 
Well, affliction brings us back to an obedience of God's word. Once again, a desire to read it, and I read this previously, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Not only a desire to read it, but a desire to do it. Uh, The desire to have this truly be a lamp that illuminates my path and then to follow that path. In the Bible, the term going astray, it speaks of a wandering off in ignorance. Before I was afflicted, I went astray or I wandered off in ignorance, kind of like a child. We were at the park for Father's Day. My grandchildren are, are young, especially Max. Max is pretty young. And so what did we do? We kept an eye on Max because Max sees ducks on a lake over there, and so Max will just wander off towards ducks in a lake. Or if you're in a mall, you've got your child, and you're holding on to your child, because you'll see your child will see something interesting, and they'll just wander off to their detriment if they're not watched over, if they're not kept, and we do the same thing. It's the world and the things of the world. It's the flesh, and it's the devil who tempts us, and we wander off sometimes in ways that we ought not to go. In Isaiah 53, verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, Messiah, the iniquity of us all. Affliction affliction brings us back to the right understanding. So obedience in God's word, but also the right understanding in God's word. When we're afflicted, when we're bent over by that heavy load, we start, okay, Lord, what exactly are you telling me here in your word? What is it that I'm not really getting that this affliction has come into my life? And I know, I understand, because God, if God is afflicting you for correction or for change in your life, he's going to let you know. You're going to have to ignore this in order to not receive of it. And so when God afflicts us for his purposes, he lets us know. And so I, I want to have understanding that I will know, God, what you're doing in my life and what you desire from my life. This is an experiential understanding of the interaction between God and man through his word. As you mature in your Christian life, as you consume more and more of God's word, sit in more and more Bible studies and see the application of your life, and then you find through practice, as I do these things, I'm blessed. If I don't do these things, then I'm not receiving the blessings of God. Then I learn to walk in the ways that God has set before me. Real life experiences the word of God working in our lives. That's why I pray before study, Lord, make this applicable to the lives who are here. Because as we look at the lives who are here, we're on the internet right now, the people who are listening or watching, everybody's at a different place in their Christian life. God's doing a different work in everybody's life. God's doing a work through his word even now, and he's doing something different in every life that is represented here. Lord, give me understanding in the things that you are doing. Verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. A statute is a law given by a a executive, or in this particular case, by a creator. It's a law that has come, and we have that understanding come from the absolute top. And so the psalmist, you know what, that affliction that I had, Remember that affliction and I prayed and prayed that, you, that God would take it you know, and have it go away and you didn't pray that it would go away. You prayed that it would achieve its purposes. Well, guess what? It achieved its purposes and now the psalmist understands it's good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes, that I may learn your word so that once again I would know and understand your desires. Another thing to be learned from this ninth stanza is something of a contradiction when it comes to afflictions. Now, remember, Psalm 119 is an acrostic psalm. That means each stanza starts with a progressive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Each verse within that stanza starts with that same letter. So the first stanza, it started with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, alpha, And all of the verses in there started with that as well. Now, the letter used here in this particular stanza is called Teth. This is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet used for good. And five of these eight verses, the first word in the Hebrew writings is good. And the idea is, is the joining together of good and affliction. Do we, we don't usually do that. Affliction is what we want to avoid, 
It's something that is definitely not desired. But the psalmist is coming to the understanding of the good that God works. So, again, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, he knows, we know, we understand that all things work together for the good. But we know that all of those things, well, some of them are, are pretty hard. Some of them we could consider just over the top, but God wants us to understand, although they within themselves may not be good, they're working together for the good. Kind of used that this morning in our uh, meeting for Vacation Bible School. It's about God's creation. Really, it's about God's plan and how God's plan works together. When the decor starts going up for VBS, you'll see a lot of gears. And that's the thing about a gear. You have one that moves and it interlocks with another, and then you'll have another gear that interlocks with this one. And all of these things are working together for some good purpose. Well, that's how God works. That's how God's Word works. We don't always get to see the end result. The gear that's in the middle just knows that it's to interact with this one and it's to push this one. And as long as I do my spot, my part, then I know that I'm in the will of the, uh, of the master builder in achieving the purpose. And so the concept is that affliction, which seems so bad to man, works so good to those who love God. Verse 73 <clears throat> your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you will be glad when they see me because I have hope in your word. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let, I pray, your merciful kindness be for my comfort according to your word to your servant. Let your tender mercies come to me that I may live. For your law is my delight. At the, let the proud be ashamed, for they treated me wrongfully with falsehood. But I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, those who know your testimonies. Let my heart be blameless regarding your statutes, that I may not be ashamed. The thing about the psalmist, when it comes to affliction, it sounds like he's getting it. And he's also understanding that part of the good that God wants to work in our afflictions is that others would see and others would learn the lesson. See, sometimes you're God's billboard. You're God's billboard for a changed life. We all are. You're God's billboard for blessings that other people would desire blessings as well. But you're also God's billboard for trust in the midst of affliction. Because affliction happens to us all. Again, Job wrote, man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. Once again, we live in a, in a time when people run red lights because they're reading their cell phone and everything else. And those difficult days are sure to come for, my, for us all, but it's in the midst of it as I see somebody else trusting in God and gaining hope in the midst of a situation that I would be of the mindset to do so also. It's in this stanza that the psalmist realized that this is not just affliction that enters his life, but this is definitely affliction that has been sent from God. Now, we'd saw, seen a couple of weeks ago in our study in James, all good things come from God. And so what comes from God that tells me is good. And so afflictions are good and even necessary in our lives. Now, King David had sinned. And God determined that he was going to send affliction for the purpose of correction. David had numbered his people, and so God, when he was disciplining him, he gave him a choice. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verses 10 through 14, it said, And David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. He, this was sin. He knew it was sin. He was warned that it was sin, and he went and did it anyway. And the idea here is pride was entering into David, numbering his people so he could base that or base the numbers on or base his uh, rule on how great a king that he really is. And David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Now when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourselves, that I may do it to you. So there's going to be repercussions for his actions. Verse 13. So Gad came to David and told him, and he said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days plague in your land? 
Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. He's basically saying, you basically choose your, your, your punishment. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. He's asking that this affliction would be chosen by God and administered by God. Because just as the psalmist does, David as well understood that it's going to be that which God works in him and through him that is going to be a beneficial, uh, beneficial both to him and to his kingdom. We need to understand that. Are you bold enough? Are you bold enough to stand before the Lord, not just to repent, but Lord, whatever is necessary in my life that you would allow it to come in and that God, you would change me and you would do that work because we all want to be changed for the better, prayerfully be more like Christ. We all want God to do a work within us, but sometimes those deep things that are necessary for big change, they can hurt. They, they, they can be uncomfortable, and they can be downright, well, they just turn our lives upside down. Psalmist said in verse 75, back in Psalm 119, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. There's something that I noticed. We used to have a cat. My daughter <clears throat> was not doing very well in school, and so my wife foolishly told her, I think it was, if you get straight A's, we'll buy you a cat. And guess what Kelly did? The only time in her life she got straight A's, we got a cat. Matter of fact, she ended up running off. She didn't run off and get married, but she got married, and we still had a cat. This cat was the worst animal that anybody could ever really have. It didn't like human beings, which we all were. So it didn't like anybody within our family. It would live its life underneath the bed, and it would lay on its back and scratch the bottom of our bed. So all of our beds were all torn up underneath. This cat was not a good animal. It never did anything. But I noticed something about it. Neither did it ever suffer affliction. I cleaned out its toilet. We fed it every night. It lived a very luxurious life. That's what we all seek. Maybe not the toilet part, but that's what we all seek. We all seek just to have that life of leisure, at least the world does. But God allows affliction because God wants change, because God wants us to lend ourselves towards godliness. In verse 73, the psalmist said, Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. And that's kind of the answer here to this useless cat versus God's children. See, that cat will never gain understanding and learn commandments because, number one, the cat was as arrogant as the day is long, but it was, a, it was an animal. But the psalmist accentuates here what sets us apart from the rest of God's creation. When God created all, he spoke it into existence. But when God created mankind, what did he do? He fashioned mankind. Matter of fact, it even speaks of his loving attention in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. When it goes into the detail, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Again, it speaks of the intimacy of God as he's breathed life into mankind. He didn't breathe it into the animal kingdom. He spoke them into existence, but there's something special in his relationship with man and his affection towards mankind. And so again, back up in 73, your hands have made me and they fashioned me. Give me understanding. He's understanding what God is able to do. He wants to go deeper with God. Give me understanding. I want to learn your commandments. And, and, and maybe a better term for us today, I just want to learn the totality of your word, how all this goes together, how it works in my life, and how it works as I minister to it to other people, that I would understand the elements of salvation, that I would understand the need to grow into discipleship, sanctification, if you will, that I would understand that I've got this great reward laid up in heaven for me, that I would know the ends of this earth and understand that one day it's going to 
come to an end, but I have eternity with God. And what that would do is would strengthen my faith today, but also my hope as I trust in God for tomorrow. And there's a lot here that is contained in God's Word. And what our psalms is looking at tonight is the strength that he's gaining from this, the, these afflictions and, and how his senses are being sharpened towards God's Word that he's able to get this wisdom from the Lord. God made man special and gave him the ability to understand, and now the psalmist has come to an understanding based upon God's word in the midst of his afflictions. Verse 75. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right. He has come to the understanding of God's rightful judgments. Uh, I'm sorry, in the last part of it. And that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness best seen when we're going through the difficult days. Have you understand? Have you ever tried to understand? Do you have an understanding of what it is that God is faithful to? What is it that God is faithful to? It doesn't really make sense. I once heard somebody give a study on God is faithful to himself. I mean, there's truth in it, but you know, what does that mean? I think God has made it very direct. What God is faithful to, he's faithful, and he's faithful in all areas, but what God is faithful to, he's faithful to his word. And that's why we can have such a confidence in the scriptures. Because not only, I mean, it's not just about these things God's telling me to do. These are also things God's telling me that he's going to do in my life as well. And if I'm faithful, I understand that, wow, the faithfulness of God and how he moves. But even if I'm not faithful, God remains faithful nonetheless. And so as God is faithful to his word, why wouldn't I be in his word? Why wouldn't I gain an understanding of his word? The afflictions that I receive from God are right for me in their corrective purposes and all that God desires. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, again, in our James study, we understand this concept of temptations in the midst of affliction. God brings affliction into our lives for the purpose of changing us, bringing us more towards godliness and his desire in our lives. Now, in the midst of these afflictions, there's the temptation to take the easy way out. But what's the problem with the easy way out is the lesson is not learned. And if the lesson is not learned, then I'm just going to have to go through that affliction again. So what does the devil do? He offers us the easy way out of the affliction. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to hinder God's purposes and hinder God's plans. But here we're reminded in 1 Corinthians, hey, no temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape. That tells me that there, when the temptation comes on in the midst of affliction, God will show me the direction that I need to go. The enemy is trying to get me to escape the affliction. God, in the midst of the affliction, will set the pathway that I need to take. Verse 76 Let, I pray, your merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to your word to your servant. Here we see the psalmist has come to the understanding that God's unfailing love will be his comfort in affliction. God loves us. He loves us to, well, more than we can ever imagine. He loves us just simply because he loves us. It's that sacrificial love that caused him to send his son to be killed upon the cross. Yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for the godless. But here we get a greater picture of he who comforts us, and the comfort that he gives us is based upon the love that he has for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation. doesn't say he makes our tribulation go away. It says he meets us in the midst of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 
And so again, an element of maturity here. God has met you in the midst of your tribulation. You'll have an understanding and you'll be able to encourage somebody who is going through tribulation, being able to express to them, just as God met you in the midst of your tribulation and, and met you in a very real and practical way, that he'll do the same in the midst of theirs. Now, why is that important? It's important because when you're in the midst of a trial and affliction, tribulation, whatever, things just seem like they just spin out of control. You wonder once again, where's God and, you know, what's going to happen to me? Is this going to be, I mean, we just have all of these thoughts. Now, if you have somebody, a fellow brother or sister, who's gone through something similar you're able to connect with them and you're able to learn from them and understand that, again, there was the going into the affliction, there was the affliction itself, but also there was the deliverance from the affliction. Just as they suffered then as you are now, you will be as they are now as well when God makes the determination at the end. And so what Paul is writing here is, is that our God is the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our tribulation. Why? That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. In verse 77, let your tender mercies come to me that I may live for your law is my delight. He has come to understand God's compassion in the midst of affliction. What did the gods of that day, what did they require of the people who worshiped them? Human sacrifice, literally human sacrifice, but also human sacrifice to dead works. Human sacrifice as men and women would sacrifice their souls to these immoral gods that could do nothing for them but demanded everything of them. But our God, our God exhibits not just compassion or mercy, but it says here tender mercies. And the idea is to a father to his child or a mother to her child. It's a biblical fact, James chapter 2 verse 13, that mercy triumphs over judgment. If you're a born-again believer today, you understand that. So, Proverbs 3:12, the Lord love whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son in whom he delights. And then the psalmist comes to an understanding that even his afflictions are a witness. Verse 74 and 79. <clears throat> Those who fear you will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in your word. Verse 79. Let those who fear you turn to me, those who know your testimonies. May men and women look at the afflictions, God, that you have afflicted me with. Let me see, may they see that weight. And not so much how I carried that weight, but how you carried me as I carried that weight. That you were with me every step of the way and never did you leave me or never did you forsake me. And again, other people would see that and they would be encouraged in their Christian lives. Because again, all of us, as we're all afflicted, we're also going to be met in the midst of affliction by our Lord. Last stanza for tonight, verses 81 through 88. My soul faints for your salvation, but I hope in your word. My eyes fail from searching your word, saying, When will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in smoke, yet I do not forget your statutes. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? The proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. All your commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help me. They almost made an end of me on earth, but I did not forsake your precepts. Revive me according to your loving kindness, so that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. He's not testing God here. Matter of fact, this is really in the form, if you look at it, of a prayer. A prayer in the midst of afflictions based upon the promises of God contained in what we've just read, but contained in what we see throughout the scriptures. Again, it's important to understand and to know the promises of God because sometimes is all you really have to hold on to in, re in reality. That's all you have to hold on to is the promises of the Lord and, and the things that God has spoken to you and the things that God has said, understanding in the midst of aff your affliction that your Lord is watching over you and keeping you. Uh, again, David would, would write later on in Psalm, Psalm 139, 
where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? So again, a question is asked in the scripture. The answer is to the negative. The implied answer is nowhere. Where can I go from your spirit? Nowhere. Where can I flee from your presence? Nowhere. He says, if I ascend into heaven, and the idea is if he ascends into outer space, if I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, he's not talking about the place of judgment so much, but into the depths of the earth. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning, if I get up at dawn at daybreak, or if I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, if I go into the deepest parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely darkness has fallen on me, and so he's talking about this times in the midst of trials or the midst of affliction, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. And so the idea here is, as the psalmist, as David comes to this understanding of the omnipresence of God, he sees it, that it's for his own good. See, there's been affliction, and a lot of times, kind of like what we saw with David earlier as he numbered the people and affliction came, we want to hide from God. Just think what would happen if Adam was able to effectively hide in the bushes, and if he could, he can't, but if he could, hide from the Lord. Just think if you could effectively hide your sin from God, it would never get dealt with. And sin that is never dealt with, well, you'll have to give an account for it on that day that you stand before the Lord in judgment. But sin that is exposed and sin that is acknowledged is sin that has the opportunity to be dealt with. How do we deal with such with, with any sin? Is to repent before the Lord, is to turn and to go in God's way and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God, God will never leave us nor forsake us. God is always there as we just seen. And it's not to bring judgment upon us. It's the same reason that two-year-old child, that you don't just let him run off to the lake or run off into the mall, because you know he's going to get into trouble that could be detrimental to his life. And it's the same reason why God doesn't leave us or forsake us, that we would not go running off in a direction that is detrimental <clears throat> to our, our life. Verse 84 is an interesting verse. This is the first verse that does not mention in any form the word of God. It says, How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? And, and I just look at this from the perspective, and we'll close with this thought. I just look at this as the perspective that the psalmist at this point has become overwhelmed by some sort of hardship, some sort of trial, some sort of affliction, and he's lost his life's focal point, God's word, and everything seems to lose focus here. Although he was brought to the edge, God never let him fall, but it seems that he has been brought just that to the edge. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute? When will this affliction end? And again, remember the answer that we've looked at so many times? It will end, well, how long will it go? Just as long is as necessary for God to achieve his purposes. And he goes on again in verse 85, the proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. So he's starting to come again to this realization. I'm God's child. I'm in God's word. To the best of my ability, I conduct myself according to God's word. But these people are contrary to God's word. Verse 86, all of your commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongly. Help me. They almost made an end of me on earth, but I did not forsake your precepts. Revive me according to your loving kindness so they may keep the testimony of your mouth. That the word of God working in my life would shine through and people would see the glory of God just simply through my humble obedience. And so the psalmist in the midst of affliction, as affliction is a reality in all of our lives, sees how God enters into it, but also how God is seen through it. Understand that the next time you come into trial, the next time affliction comes upon you. Rely upon the promises of God, understanding that the word of God is what gets us through these things. And as God is faithful, God's always faithful to his word. Father, once again, we just thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word. And Lord, it's living and it's powerful. Lord, it never changes, but it's always there. 
And it's always there, and it's always meeting us where we are at, even as we wander off, even as we get lost, get into trouble, and even as our lives are threatened, you're always there, Lord. Your word tells us that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And so, Father, may we never sell you short. May we always be reminded of who you are. May we always be forever in your word. And I pray as we are that, God, you would use it for your glory. Lord, I lift up those who have come out tonight that you would go before them this coming week. I pray, Father, that as you give us opportunity, we would see it and that, Lord, we would grasp onto it. And so, Father, we just thank you for this evening. We just lift all to you and to your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you all stand, please? A couple of things. We have door-to-door ministry that is going out this Saturday. They're meeting here at the church at 9 o'clock. And the couple study, we pretty much have passed out all of the books. We ordered some more. If you were planning on signing up for the couple study, it's not too late, so you can still do so if, uh, if the Lord's leading you in that direction. Other than that, keep up in prayer. Um, Vacation Bible School, we're just a matter of weeks away. We ministered to a lot of kids last year, a lot that didn't come to our church. And for some, that's the only Jesus that they're able to get. Also, Craft is having a a meeting. If you want to come and help the ladies, and men too, I guess, uh, put together some of the crafts, they're meeting together, they're getting together this coming Wednesday. You'll have to see my wife about the time. I'm not sure about it. 11 o'clock? 11 o'clock here at the church. God bless you guys.
Good night. You guys have a great uh, evening, a better week. God bless you.